The border is not just a wall. It's not just a line on a map. It's not any particular physical location. It's a power structure, a system of control. The border is everywhere that people live in fear of deportation, everywhere migrants are denied the rights accorded citizens, everywhere human beings are segregated into included and excluded. The border does not divide one world from another. There is only one world, and the border is tearing it apart. No Wall They Can Build, A Guide to Borders and Migration Across North America, authored by an ex-desert aid worker, published in 2017 by the Crime Think Ex-Workers Collective. Abolish every border, including intellectual property rights. No copyright. This audiobook version produced in 2018 by the Ex-Worker Podcast Collective. A full-size electronic version of the diagram of the North American border regime is available at crimethink.com slash borders. You can obtain a print poster of the diagram and a great deal of related material at crimethink.com. Dedication for everyone who didn't make it and for everyone who did. This book describes the U.S.-Mexico border as I've experienced it since 2008. I wrote some sections of this text in 2011, which were distributed under the title Designed to Kill, Border Policy and How to Change It. I wrote the rest of it in 2016, in the months leading up to the U.S. presidential elections. As of February 2017, it is too early to say if the Trump administration will fundamentally change the system that I describe here. It is possible that some of what I have to say will become outdated over the next few years. For the time being, it seems inevitable that the suffering and death that I have witnessed on the border will continue to intensify under the new regime, and that the current authorities will persecute undocumented people even more ruthlessly than the former ones did. If so, I hope that this book will serve as a reminder that all was not well during the Clinton, Bush, or Obama years, either and that the issues that I address here will not be resolved by simply putting the right people back in charge. The question is not who should manage the border, it is how to abolish it. But permit me to make my case. They're coming, they're coming. Ya vienen. It was clear and cold, and the Big Dipper had been revolving over our heads. Jose, Maria, and I were huddled together trying to stay warm. For the first time since I had met her, Maria sounded panicked. Heavy boots were pounding towards us in the dark. One of the agents threw some kind of lasso around us and grabbed me by the neck. ¿Dónde está tu grupo? ¿Dónde están los demás? I'm going to remain silent. I'd like to speak to a lawyer. I tried to sound as calm as possible, but my voice probably broke. I had been hiking well north of the border in Southern California. I ran into Jose and Maria just before dark. They had been lost for days and they were getting sicker by the hour. This was back during the bush years. I didn't have a cell phone then. We were miles from my car in a desolate place. I didn't know what to do. I decided to stay with them. Maria's husband had abandoned her and her four children. She gave me to understand that she'd been doing sex work in order to put food on the table. Jose had ridden the freight trains up the border. He couldn't talk about it. I didn't know exactly what had happened to him during the trip. I had a bad feeling that something was going to happen. A helicopter had circled over us earlier. On a cold night like that, we lit up their infrared like a Christmas tree. We were dead meat. Are you her husband? What are you doing out here? What the hell is going on? You're under arrest. I'm going to remain silent. I'd like to speak to a lawyer. They threw us into the van. Maria had regained her composure. She put her arm around my shoulders. No te preocupes, she told me. Vamos a sobrevivir. Don't worry, we'll survive. 
Jose dropped his head, shook it back and forth, looked up at me, smiled, and dropped his head again. They brought us to the Border Patrol detention facility. There were 200 of us, sitting in rows under the lights, waiting to be taken in. They had separated Jose and Maria from me. I could see them way over on the other side of the yard. I would never see Jose again. The man next to me spoke perfect English. I'm completely fucked, bro. My life is totally destroyed. I'm not doing so good either, I told him. Where are you from? Detroit, he said. Motown, Lions Roar, the 313, you know? My wife's there, my kids, everybody. This is the third time I've gotten caught trying to get back home. I'm going to jail for sure this time. And if they ever catch me again, I don't even know what they'll do. I don't know how my wife is going to pay the bills. I don't know who's picking up the kids from school. I don't know anything. Me neither, I said. I wish I could put those motherfuckers in my shoes. I wish I could do them like they're doing me. I wish I could turn their lives upside down. I wish I could make somebody pay for this. I looked over the sea of faces. So do I. They put 80 of us into a holding cell the size of a bedroom. We were piled on top of each other to the point that people had to take turns lying underneath the toilet. Each one of my arms and legs was stacked underneath or on top of those of other people. One man was wearing a plastic hospital gown. The bandages on his left hand and bicep were soaked through with blood. The dogs had torn off his jacket and chewed up his arm. Every once in a while, the guards would pull me out of the cell for interrogation. What do you care what happens to these people? Who do you work for? What are you really doing? I'm going to remain silent. I'd like to speak to a lawyer. Eventually, they would give up and put me back in with the others. The heat and stench and overcrowding got so bad that I thought there would be a riot. People were starting to lose it. One of the older men tried to reason with one of the guards. Oficial, por favor, there are too many of us in here. The people are going to start fighting with each other. We would be easier to control if you would split us up in two cells. Fuck you, wetback. You shouldn't have gotten picked up on a weekend. One of the younger men also tried. Sir, I take psych meds. They're with my stuff. I'm afraid I might start flipping out if I miss my dose. Can you see if I can find them? Yeah, yeah, you want your medication? Come here, I'll give you your medication. They took him out of the cell, punched him in the face, and tased him in front of all of us. There's your fucking medication. Eventually, one of the older men stood up on the toilet and sang corrido. One of the younger men followed suit, and then another, and then another, and against all odds, the group kept its composure. After three days of this, one of the guards opened up the door and pointed at me. You, U.S. citizen, come with me. They're letting you go. On our way out of the facility, the guard had taken a phone call. Stay right here, he told me, and he left me alone, in front of the plate glass window of the women's holding cell. And there was Maria, sitting in the back. I waved frantically at her, and she walked up to the front of the cell. I pointed at myself and made the universal walking sign with my index and middle finger. She pointed at me, and then towards the exit down the hall. I nodded, and she nodded back. We looked at each other. She put her hand up to the glass, and I put my hand up to hers. I made a fist with my other hand and tapped it three times over my heart. She made a fist and tapped three times back. I could hardly keep it together. She wasn't going to Los Angeles to send money home to her children and mom. She was going back to sex work in Mexicali. It just wasn't right. Footsteps were coming down the hall. I broke eye contact at the last possible moment, turned around, and tried to look normal. The guard rounded the corner. Let's go, buddy. You're going home. And I walked out the door behind him, blinking back tears back into the sun. Some years later, I moved to Arizona. Mexico and Central America, who walk through the Sonoran Desert into the United States. Over more than 20 years, the government of the United States has channeled this stream of human movement into increasingly remote areas of its southern border, and many thousands of people have died from heat, cold, sickness, injuries, 
hunger, and thirst as a direct result. The mission of No More Deaths is to end this death and suffering in the borderlands. No More Deaths is an open organization, and our work is legal under American law. The American government has nonetheless arrested and attempted to prosecute our volunteers on various occasions. The July 2005 arrest of Daniel Strauss and Shanti Sells was the most widely publicized case. As of this writing, all of these prosecutions have ultimately failed, and no one has ever been convicted of any crime in conjunction with our work in the desert. No More Deaths was established in 2004, and people from all over the world and all walks of life have volunteered with us since then. We've spent these years familiarizing ourselves with the Sonoran Desert. We find places to leave food and water along the trails that cross through it, look for migrants in distress, and provide medical care when we run into someone who needs it. We maintain a base camp in the desert year-round, where we can provide more extensive care. If a situation is bad enough, we can get an ambulance or helicopter to bring people to the hospital. We strive to act in accordance with travelers' wishes at all times, and we never call the Border Patrol on those who don't wish to turn themselves in. Our efforts have unquestionably helped to reduce the number of deaths on the Arizona border. During the time that I worked in the desert, I was directly involved in many extraordinary situations and indirectly involved in many more. Some of the things I've seen have been truly heartwarming, and some of them have been deeply sad and wrong. I've seen people who are too weak to stand, too sick to hold down water, too badly hurt to continue, too scared to sleep, too sad for words, hopelessly lost, desperately hungry, literally dying of thirst, never going to be able to see their children again, vomiting blood, penniless in torn shoes 2,000 miles from home, suffering from heat stroke, kidney damage, terrible blisters, wounds, hypothermia, post-traumatic stress, and just about every other tribulation you could possibly think of. I've been to places where people were robbed and raped and murdered. My friends have found bodies. In addition to bearing witness to the suffering of others, I myself have fallen off of cliffs, torn my face open on barbed wire, run out of water, had guns pointed at me, been handcuffed, arrested, jailed, charged by bulls, circled by vultures, stalked by mountain lions, jumped over rattlesnakes, pulled pieces of cactus out of many different parts of my body with pliers, had to tear my pants off because they were full of fire ants, gotten gray hairs, and in general poured no small amount of my own sweat, blood, and tears into the thirsty desert. I've been humbled countless times by the incredible selflessness and courage of the people that I met there and I have been driven nearly out of my head with rage at the heartless economic and political system that drives people to such lengths in order to provide for their families. I met thousands of people like Jose and Maria, each with a unique story to tell, but at least one thing in common. To the people who write border policy, their lives hold no value, and their deaths bring no consequences. Doing this work has given me a great deal of opportunity to observe how the border is managed on a day-to-day -day basis, and hopefully some insight into the functions it performs within global capitalism, the real objectives it serves. I've been positioned on one of the front lines of global migration over an extended period of time, a vantage point shared by relatively few. This is how I see it. North America comprises a single economy, which is divided by two major borders. One runs between the United States and Mexico, the other between Mexico and Guatemala. Many people are compelled to migrate across these borders by pressures largely beyond their control. The objective of both American and Mexican border policy is not to stop this migration, but to manage and control it to the benefit of identifiable sectors of both societies, and with the deaths of thousands of people as the predictable and intended result. Ultimately, Immigration controls in this part of the world amount to a form of systematic segregation in which the movements and civil rights of certain people are curtailed due to place of birth. In other words, apartheid. What's more, the same two borders that divide North America circumscribe the entire globe for basically the same reasons and with basically the same results. They separate core states from buffer states and buffer states from peripheral states. Just as North America comprises a single economy, there's only one world economy. It siphons resources through the marketplace from the periphery to the core. I'm paraphrasing Emanuel Wallerstein's world systems analysis, although I arrived at similar conclusions on the basis of my experience in the desert before I discovered his work. 
millions, if not billions of human beings are either fungible or superfluous in this global economy. And these borders exist to regulate their movements, to keep these people in their place. I believe that both basic decency and common sense dictate that citizens of the global north take concrete steps to undermine this global caste system and to reintegrate ourselves with the rest of humanity. First, because it's the right thing to do. Also, because otherwise the situation will become so untenable that our own safety and survival will eventually be at stake. One place to start is on the border. There are many other places to begin. This book is a product of the seven years that my friends and I spent in the desert trying to find our way. It is a synthesis of countless conversations, interactions, and experiences that I shared with thousands of people, migrants, refugees, and undocumented people, people involved with human trafficking, drug smuggling, and law enforcement, my coworkers and fellow volunteers with no more deaths, and people that I spent time with while living, working, traveling, and participating in social movements throughout Mexico and Central America. The conclusions I've come to are my own, I don't speak for the organization No More Deaths, or for anyone other than myself. I think that most of what I have to say won't be news to many undocumented people, or to many people who live in Mexico or Central America. I'll take responsibility for anything that doesn't ring true. I'm writing mostly for readers with first world citizenship who are interested in understanding the dynamics of migration in North America, and especially for those working in the interests of migrants and refugees and for a world without borders. I hope that some of what I've seen can be useful toward that end. I offer these words as ammunition to anyone who cares to intervene when other people are treated like pieces of meat. It's good that you keep the bones here, Jesus told me. We were standing in front of a large pile of bones, mostly deer and cow, that our volunteers had collected from the desert. The animals suffer from hunger and thirst as we do. They are hunted as we are. They die alone as we do, and nobody knows or cares. It's good that they should be remembered also. Jesus was working at a muffler shop in Bakersfield when he got deported. His wife and children were waiting for him there. They had been waiting for six months while he was stuck back in Michoacan. When he found our camp, he had been walking through the desert for six days, alone and half mad from dehydration and exposure. His shoulder-length black hair was tied into a neat ponytail. He was wearing a weather-beaten denim jacket, faded blue jeans, a handsome belt buckle, a simple necklace, and a well-fitted black t-shirt from a Southern California motorcycle club. Even after such a terrifying ordeal, there was no denying that the man had style. They treat us like animals, he said. Jesus is home now, welding mufflers and raising his children. Before he walked out of our camp and back into the desert, he found a gigantic heart-shaped piece of driftwood in the arroyo, painted it blood red, and placed it on a waist-high pedestal of roxy painted white. This is our heart, he told me, the heart of the people, all of us, of everyone who walks through here, of everyone who works here, of everyone who died here, of the cows and the deer and the rabbits, too. Maybe someday things will be different. I'll come back down here and visit, and we'll all sit around this thing and tell stories about everything that happened. May we live to see that day. Benedicto, may your trails be crooked, winding, Lonesome, dangerous, leading to the most amazing view. Edward Abbey. You've just listened to episode one of No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America, published by the Crime Think X Workers Collective. Stay tuned next week for episode two, Defining Terms, The Aftermath, and The Travelers. This audiobook is a production of the X-Worker Podcast Collective. You can check us out at crimethink.com slash podcast. To order a print copy of the book, read a free PDF version online, check out the poster that accompanies the book, 
or to learn more about the anarchist struggle for a world without borders, visit crankthink.com slash borders. To learn more about No More Deaths and solidarity work in the desert along the U.S.-Mexico border, visit nomoredeaths.org.